Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of July 1st, 2013. This is just a little bit of a continuation of a case that we started with, or at least touched upon last week. And we've got actually a series of cases, the first of which we are going to use was sent by Dr. Tarindu Uyanagi. I sure hope I'm getting that name right. Uh, Dr. Uyanagi works in Melbourne, Australia, and sent a, uh, this case. It was a 46-year-old woman that he was taking care of. The patient presented with central chest pain that's been going on and off for the past 12 hours. Now, he went ahead and he got a troponin. Troponin was negative, so this is a negative troponin after intermittent chest pain for 12 hours. There was some association with the exertion. The EKG, however, was done without any pain at the time, and the EKG really didn't show anything that was definitive. <clears throat> when you look at this 12 lead, uh, maybe there's some TY flattening and some very, very slight ST segment downsloping in a couple of leads. Now, remember, your computer is going to call this nonspecific ST or T wave abnormality because the computer, as we've said before, will only call something positive if there's at least a millimeter of ST segment change. But anyway, again, the patient is not having any chest pain at the time of this 12 lead EKG. And so maybe we're not going to make a whole lot of this. Dr. Uyanagi had gotten a negative troponin and was able to arrange close follow-up with the cardiology within 24 hours. That's pretty darn good. Troponin negative after 12 hours of chest pain. EKG unremarkable. The patient's ambulatory in the ED without any chest pain or shortness of breath. So I think a lot of people might consider this a relatively low-risk chest pain that is suitable for close outpatient follow-up and stress testing. But he was just a little bit uncomfortable about this. Maybe had a little bit of a hunch that something more needs to be done. So you got a repeat EKG. Uh, again, patient is still pain-free. And the repeat EKG has shown a slight abnormality that he was able to pick up on. You'll notice that the T waves in V2 and V3 are looking just a little bit different. Let me go back to the original 12 lead. Take a look at the T waves in leads. V2 and V3, they're fair. V3 is kind of flat, but V2 looks pretty normal. And then we advance and take a look at the 12 lead a little bit later on. And you clearly see that it's become a bit biphasic in both of these leads. Some of you already know what we're going to be talking about, right? He repeated the 12 lead a short time later. And again, that biphasicity, a term that, uh, may be real or not, but uh, challenge me on it. That's okay. Bifav biphasicity <laughs> um, was concerning to Dr. Uyanagi. And uh, again, what we're going to be talking about is something called Wellens sign or Wellens waves or Wellens syndromes, which as predicted, uh, ended up revealing that this patient has a critical stenosis in the proximal LAD. The patient went for cath and got a stent, ended up doing well, but... It was only because of the repeat 12 lead and the subtle Wellens pickup by Dr. Uyanagi, perhaps, that this patient is still alive today. So let's talk about Wellens sign or Wellens syndrome or what Marriott, the famous electrocardiography expert, used to refer to as Wellens warning when you see those biphasic T waves in the mid precordial leads in V1, V2. Uh, I'm sorry, in V2, V3, sometimes out in V4. Now, this is an electrocardiographic T wave abnormality in the mid precordial leads, V2, V3, sometimes V4, that was first identified in 1982. And I find this somewhat stunning that this was first described in the cardiology literature in 1982. And yet there are so many folks in cardiology and in medicine, any in emergency medicine also, that still don't know about this. And yet multiple other people have published on this and this is not an uncommon abnormality. For anybody out there who knows about Wellens, I know you've seen it, you've seen it a few times a year and it's very important because it predicts a critical obstruction in the proximal LAD. That's a terrible place to have a big lesion in the proximal LAD. And no surprise, these patients are at high risk for having a big anterior MI or dying. Now, in this original study back in 1982, Wellens and colleagues described two T-wave abnormalities in those leads. Now, type one is the easy one, deep symmetric inverted T-waves, no big deal. Nobody's going to miss that. Your computer is going to pick that up. Your first year medical student is going to pick that up. 
The custodians are going to walk by and say, hey, that patient needs to go to the cath lab when they see that. Nobody's going to miss that. So we're not going to spend time talking about that because nobody misses that. What we need to spend time talking about is the type 2 Wellens pattern because this type 2 pattern oftentimes is missed. It's a simple biphasic, whoop, sorry about that. It's a simple biphasic T wave pattern in those mid precordial leads. Notice again that this is purely a T wave abnormality. You do not need to have ST elevation or depression. It's purely a T wave abnormality. And your computer oftentimes calls this nonspecific. Your formal interpretation is often nonspecific. And emergency physicians that don't know about this will sometimes call this nonspecific as well. What I hope to convey to you in the next 10 minutes or so is that this is not nonspecific. It's actually very highly specific and concerning for proximal LAD obstruction. Now, again, just a couple things that we mentioned already. The ST changes are often absent. This is purely a T wave abnormality. A couple of, uh, of other real important points also. This T wave abnormality will persist even when the patient's symptoms have resolved. So it's not something that only shows up during pain and then goes away when they're painless or is asymptomatic. It will persist even in the pain-free state. That's what Wellens and colleagues originally described in their syndrome. And also cardiac biomarkers are not necessarily elevated. In other words, this T-wave abnormality doesn't mean that the patient has infarcted yet. It's highly concerning that the patient will go on to infarct. And in fact, the natural history that they reported was that 75% of these patients would go on to develop a big MI or die unless they had early invasive therapy. Medical management did not work. And again, that's no surprise when you're looking at a critical occlusion in the proximal LAD. Medical management, not so good for these big lesions in the LAD. One other interesting point, and I've, I know of one case where this has happened, and I've read about a few other cases as well. And if you know of cases, send them in so we can share them and get word out about this. Treadmill stress testing is not a good idea. The, the literature seems to indicate in just case reports that when these patients get put on a treadmill, they have a tendency to drop dead, not good. Uh, and again, that may not be a big surprise when you consider that these are critical proximal LAD occlusions. You would never put a patient like that knowing that they've got a critical LAD occlusion on a treadmill, right? Nuclear medicine testing, stress echo, I, I don't know what to say about those. Those are probably okay, but you definitely don't want to put those patients on a treadmill. They need to go to the cath lab and be managed, diagnosed and managed invasively. All right. Okay. Well, I mentioned that this is there's no shortage of cases of Wellens, and I'll show you a few others just to hammer home this this uh, this visual diagnosis. People that have sent me this. This is a case sent by Dr. Wael Hakme, and again, I, I hope I'm getting that name right. Uh, Dr. Hakme works in Pontiac, Michigan. He had a 62 year old man that presented with ischemic chest pain. Here is the 12 lead EKG. Now, this is the type one pattern with the deep symmetric T wave inversions, V2, V3. Your EKG machine is going to pick this up. Not a big surprise. And again, no big surprise. This patient went to the cath lab and was found to have a subtotal occlusion of the proximal LAD, got a stent, had a good outcome. All right. So these are not just flip T waves indicative of some mild ischemia that you just admit to the CCU. No, these are patients with critical LAD occlusions. So when you see these huge symmetric flip T waves in those mid precordial leads, you take them seriously, you get them admitted and urgently managed. All right. Um, what else? Uh, Dr. Joel Turner, who's a program director at the EM residency at McGill in Canada, sent this a couple of years ago, 38 year old woman that he was taking care of with chest pain. And this patient presented with the biphasic T wave pattern in V2 and in V3 and a little ST depression in some of those uh, other anterior leads. Now your computer will pick this up also because this is not subtle. There's some significant ST and T wave abnormalities here. And his cardiologist didn't argue about this one. They took this patient right to the cath lab and the patient was found to have a 95% proximal LAD, actually triple vessel disease, and the proximal LAD occlusion and went for a bypass surgery later that day. And this case was sent by some folks at Ohio State University. Uh, there was three folks that sent this. Actually, Dr. Dan Bachman uh, is, was a resident at the time. This is a couple years ago as well. And he was working with another resident, Dr. Erica 
uh, Cube or Kube. Uh, again, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm getting that name incorrect. And Dr. Colin Cady, who's a friend, he's a faculty member that was supervising Dan and Erica. Uh, they had a low risk chest pain patient that was admitted to the observation unit. And the patient was admitted with this initial EKG. And uh, well, there's some subtle ST changes in this EKG as well. There's a little bit of ST segment downsloping in some of the inferior leads. And, uh, but you know, the patient's asymptomatic and had a, a fairly low risk story. So the patient goes over to the chest pain center for serial EKGs and serial troponins. And the second EKG is then obtained and new T wave, um, biphasic T waves have developed. And so they ended up sending this patient off uh, for urgent therapy. The patient ended up with a 99% LAD occlusion. Uh, what does 99% LAD occlusion mean? I don't, I don't even know how do you quantitate 99%. I mean, does that mean that one red cell is getting through that vessel at a time? I don't know. I see that every now and then and never really know what to make of it. So this patient ended up getting a stent thanks to their aggressive therapy and pickup of that Wellens wave or Wellens uh, sign um, in those mid-precordial leads. Now, it's important to know about Wellens, but it's equally important, I think, to know about some mimics of Wellens. And this is a common mimic of Wellens syndrome. Young men oftentimes have this variant of early repolarization, which produces biphasic T waves in those mid-precordial leads. Now these, these are pretty scary looking uh, T waves, right? Big exclamation mark there in V2 and V3 and flip T wave out in V4. Uh, when you see this pattern, you don't call it Wellens, okay? because there's very high voltage. And let me just tell you, you know, this is not something that was originally written in the paper by Wellens, but it's an observation that I've made over, I don't know, the past 17 years or so. When you see very large amplitude QRS complexes, all right, as you see very, very big QRS complexes, LVH-ish in nature, you're not allowed to call the T waves Wellens, all right, that's my rule. And uh, it's, and I don't know the cardiac physiology here, but uh, you've noticed it also, and this is something I've noticed as well. When you see very large QRS complexes, the subsequent T waves tend to be screwed up. And I don't know a better medical term than to simply say screwed up. Large QRS complexes produce screwed up T waves. Large QRS complexes are associated with very abnormal repolarization and it messes up those T waves. So when you see very large QRS complexes, oftentimes the T waves are messed up, they're flipped or they're biphasic and it is not specific for anything. This patient you're looking at had a clean cath. This is simply a variant of early repolarization. This is another example, take a look. There's abnormal looking T waves following these giant QRS complexes. But again, there's giant QRS complexes. And so you're, when you see these giant QRS complexes, you should expect to see abnormal T waves. This is not specific. This does not mean the patient has Wellens or a proximal LAD occlusion. And let me show you one more example. Here's a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. HCM, as we've discussed before, gives you very, very large QRS complexes. And when you have very large QRS complexes, the subsequent T waves tend to be very messed up or screwed up. And in this case, they're biphasic. This patient also is not suffering from ACS and has clean coronaries. Those biphasic T waves mean nothing. So one of the things that I tell people, when you are calling something Wellens, you need to make sure that the patient has normal size QRS complexes, okay? Again, that's not something that was written in the original paper. It's my own observation, which hasn't been published before. So you're just gonna have to trust me on that. Don't call things Wellens if the QRS complexes are very, very large, if they're LVH-ish in nature. True Wellens should only be diagnosed when the QRS complexes are relatively normal in size. So a couple other quick take home points. Again, remember Wellens syndrome, Wellens sign, Wellens warning, whatever you want to call it. This refers to these deeply inverted, that's type one, or biphasic T's, that's type two, in the mid precordial leads, V2, V3, sometimes to V4 also. And when you see those, looking, those type of T waves, 
it's highly predictive that the patient has a critical occlusion in the proximal LAD. You cannot rely on troponins to rule anything out. Troponins are often negative. These patients are often pain-free when you see these T waves as well. They need to be managed invasively and aggressively. I'm not saying you need to activate the cath lab at one o'clock in the morning. When these patients are pain-free, if there's no ST elevation, they don't meet criteria for activation of the cath lab or lytics. But these patients need to be admitted managed with antiplatelet medications, and your cardiologist need to work these patients up invasively to find out what's going on and to give them a balloon or a stent or sometimes even a bypass surgery. Medical therapy does not work well with these patients. And finally, the last takeaway point, I always like to bring up the importance of serial EKGs. There's a couple of cases I showed you today where serial EKGs made all the difference in the world. Remember, an EKG is a piece of paper and ink. It's about the cheapest test you've got, and yet it saves lives in the emergency department. So when in doubt, when you have any concern at all, get those serial EKGs, all right? Remember, good EKG interpretation saves lives. So I hope that was helpful in terms of uh, clarifying for some of you what Wellens is and maybe for confirming what you already know about Wellens. I hope that was helpful and I look forward to talking to all of you next week. Bye for now.